Amen. How many say amen to that? God's been good to us. Amen. It's good to see all of you on this bright, sunshiny Sunday morning. And uh, we're going to go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to help us today. Since Brother Michael is standing over here beside me, I'm going to ask him to come over here, if he would, grab this mic, lead us to the Lord in prayer. And it's good to see all of you. If you alternate your engines, I think y'all be able to hear. If everybody can still hear, you can get your air conditioning rolling. And uh, 
we're glad to be here. I'm thankful to be here. If y'all think y'all hot, y'all just imagine standing up here like that, getting ready to preach. Brother Michael, if you would pray for us, ask the Lord to help us. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to come together once again, Lord, as a church. And Lord, we do thank you for the blessings you've given this week. Lord, we just ask that you'll touch each and every one of the hearts here today, Lord, that they'll be open to what you have to say, Lord. Bless Brother Travis as he brings the message. Lord, touch, lead, guide, and direct, Lord, help this country, help the leaders of this country as they make decisions for us, Lord. We ask that you just touch this corona situation, Lord, that you'll know what to do, and you can just give them the knowledge to be able to handle this, Lord. We we do ask you once again, Lord, just to touch the ones that have lost loved ones. Bring those that couldn't be with us today, Lord. Bring them back to us, Lord. And we ask now that you'll just touch, lead, guide, and direct. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a couple of hymns this morning. And I think we'll sing some of y'all know. So the first one we're going to sing in the red book is page number 120. Page 120. And I think everybody knows it. It's Victory in Jesus. Y'all sing with me now. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He punched me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is given. Michael, and thank God for the victory that we do have in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Somebody help me now. All right, page 310 in our red book, the song we love around here says that glad reunion day. I'm glad there'll be a happy meeting in heaven. Page 310. See the many loved ones we've known here below. Yeah, 
together on the blessed hilltops with hearts all aglow. That will be a glad year, young day. Looking forward to that. Glad day, a wonderful day. Glad day, a glorious day. There with all the holy angels and loved ones to stay. Yes, that will be a glad reunion. Young day. Asking in the love of Jesus, beholding his face. It will seem but just a moment of praising his grace. That will be glad to you, young day. Glad day, a wonderful day. Glad day, a glorious day. There with all the holy angels. Wants to stay, yes, that will be a bad year, young day. Amen. I'm certainly looking forward to that day. I don't know about you, but I've got some loved ones over there on the other side, and I want to see them one day. And uh, I've, I've got that promise that we're going to be called up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so there's not only the promise that I'll meet my loved ones, those that we've loved and have already gone to be with the Lord, but we're going to be with Jesus, best of all, amen? I'm looking forward to that. Well, amen, yeah. Uh, just a couple of real quick announcements. It's good to have you here. Next Sunday's Mother's Day, and so next Sunday we want you to be here. We'll most likely be right here in the parking lot, uh, Lord willing, but thank God for that. Uh, but all the mothers, we want you to come. We'll have a special gift for all the moms that are here. We ain't going to forget moms on Mother's Day. Amen? Y'all be much in prayer about the situation across our nation uh, as far as the virus and all that, as far as the political realms as well. Just be praying that God would have his will in his way, have his hand upon us and protect us, lead God and direct us in all that he does, that he protect us and use us for his glory, that God would get glory in all that we say and do. Amen? That's what it's all about, that God get glory. It's not all that I get comfortable, that, but that it... That it's God gets all the glory. Is this mic dying? I need a new mic, guys. I think this mic's dying if y'all didn't turn me down. All right? Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll try it a different way. Uh, the, uh, they might have turned me down. Uh, anyhow, don't forget Wednesday night. We'll be back on the live stream Wednesday night at 7.30 or 7.15. And it's hard to get on these different times. But Wednesday night, I, I hope and pray that you're able to get on there. We've been trying to preach and at least get the Word of God, trying to have some good music uh, for you from time to time, some videos. We've tried to have some devotions and some verses and things that we post on social media for you, trying to keep you encouraged in the Lord. But let me just say this. Uh, the best encouragement you can find is when you do like David and encourage yourself in the Lord. And when you get in the Word of God and spend time with Him, you'll find the greatest encouragement you'll ever have. And in days like these, you're going to need encouragement. So... Uh, just make sure you do not ne uh, neglect to spend time with God in prayer, spend God time with God in His Word. Uh, also, uh, I believe, and I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I believe those, even those online services, they're not the same as gathering, but they're still vital to you and I. And so I encourage you to, if you have the ability to gather around at church time and get around the computer or the television, however you can tune in, and watch those services when we're not here. Uh, but Lord willing, we're going to be here more often than not from here on out. Y'all be just make that much in prayer. All right? I don't know if there's anything else that needs to be said. 
Uh, if there's a happy birthday in the midst, happy birthday to you. I don't have a list of those in front of me, but we do want to say thank you. It looks like at least just a shy a bit under 500 here this morning. So uh, we're glad to see all of you. Amen and amen. <clears throat> want to praise the Lord. God's been good to us in giving. And um, is Miss Barbara here? Did she ever come? Miss Barbara's not here. And um, so I don't know, maybe we can get Brother Benny or somebody or Brother Danny, one of them, to grab a basket at the end of the service and set up here, and you can put your offering in it, and we'll get it to her. But I want to praise the Lord. God's meeting the needs of the church. I want to thank you for that as well. Well, <clears throat> I had somebody to sing this morning, and they couldn't do it at the uh, moment. So y'all are stuck with you, your, yours truly. All right. <clears throat> so y'all pray for me, and I'm going to try my best to sing. And uh, it's hard to communicate with my wife. She's inside playing the piano. And so, honey, if you're in there, give me a key of B-flat. Used to be when I was sinning, Satan stood off. Somewhere grinning as the pleasures that he brought just turned on me. The teardrops came like rain a falling, and then I heard my Savior calling, Son, you can't go on anymore, just lean on me. And I won't. One day as before and I won't go Without Jesus just ain't so Without Jesus everything that I would do I just won't do without the Lord A beggar lame, gauge just sitting all his life He'd been regretting cause he never stood and walked on down the street. And Peter and John came by his way, look on us. Peter did say, rise and walk in the name of the Lord. And he leaped to his feet, and I won't walk. Without Jesus I won't talk Without Jesus I refuse To live one day as before No, I won't go Without Jesus it just ain't so Without Jesus That I would do I just won't do without the Lord it's everything that I would do, I just won't do without the Lord. <clears throat> Amen. Thankful for the change the Lord made in my life. I'm glad He can do that for you. Amen. And I know He has for some of you. We ought to thank the Lord for that. I'm glad things are not the way it used to be. Thankful that because of Jesus, I don't have to worry about tomorrow. Thankful for Jesus, I don't have to worry about today. This song simply says, why worry about tomorrow? Why worry about tomorrow? Why worry your steps are getting slow? If your life has been lived for Jesus, you don't have much further to go. For the next hand you shake might be the hand of the Savior. The next step you take could be on a street of purest gold. And your next week could be Married supper, and the next touch you feel 
He could be blessing your soul. So be strong now. Just keep right on going. Don't be angry when things go wrong. Don't give up. It's almost over All the signs now They're pointing toward home And the next time You shake Could be the hand Of the Savior The next step you take Could be on a street Of purest gold And your next meal Might be the marriage supper and the next touch you feel, he could be blessing your soul. Amen and amen. All right. Does anybody know what time it is? Jake, you know what time it is? Amen. It's preaching time. Get your Bibles. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Amen. Sit up. Listen up. Buckle up. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 this morning. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Can everybody hear me? Brother Steve Tysinger, can you hear me? I'm getting a little ring out here. If you can back it down just a tad or something. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy 3. Everybody with me? Say amen. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was but thou hast fully known my doctrine manner of life purpose faith long suffering charity patience persecutions afflictions which came unto me at Antioch at Iconium at Lystra what persecutions I endured but out of them all the Lord delivered me Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make the wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. With the help of the Lord, I want to preach this morning on that thought, perilous times. Perilous times. Our Father, I pray that you'd help me to preach Lord, what you put in my heart from your word this morning, I pray that God you'd help me. Pray God you'd uh, unctionize me. Give me the power that I need. I pray God you'd touch my voice. I pray most of all you'd touch my heart and help me, oh God, to preach as a dying man to dying men. 
Pray, God, you'd help us today. We need your touch. May you be glorified in all that's said and done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 1, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. The word perilous is an interesting word. That word perilous speaks of something that is hard, hard to take, hard to bear. Troublesome, dangerous, harsh, fierce, savage, difficult, furious, dangerous days. Matthew 28, or excuse me, Matthew 8, verse 28, this word is translated and used for the only other time in the New Testament. And the only other time that this word is used is translated as fierce. And it's used to describe the two men who were possessed of devils or demons. And so both times that this word is used in our King James Bible, one is fierce, one is perilous, and they are both associated with satanic, demonic influence that's involved in our society. Both times. These perilous days, these dangerous days are traumatic times. They are violent, fierce, wild, difficult times. They are grievous and hard to bear, hard to deal with. They are distressing days. They're not good times for the believer, but they are painful, they are difficult, and they are dangerous. These times will test you and I as believers and test and try our faith in the days leading up to the rapture of the church. This is a description that Paul gave Timothy of the professing church, not just the world, but of the professing church in the time just before the rapture and the return of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in days that are remarkably similar to what Paul has just described. We are living in perilous times. Would you consider with me the events around the world? We are beginning to see things in our nation that we have never seen. We are seeing pestilences. We are seeing people's hearts filled with fear. We are seeing gangs. We are seeing terrorism on the rise in our nation. But all across the world, these things have already been in existence and they are ramping up. They are, if you will, revving up and getting worse and worse as the days go. We have been protected. We have been blessed for so long. We are beginning to see here in our society, here in our culture, we are beginning to see this played out right before our very eyes. Never have you ever known in your lifetime the government of the United States to step in and tell the church that they could not meet. That's not constitutional and I'm not here to be political. I'm just trying to get you to see the days in which we live are extreme days. We are in days of danger. We are in days where many people are scared to go out of their even of their very house. We are living in days where persecution is on the rise. You have not been persecuted much in your life, but honey, buckle up, it's on the way. I'm just trying to get you to see all across the world, the Islamic nation is beheading Christians. They are persecuting them. They are imprisoning them and beating them. And it's coming, and it's coming soon. You better be ready. I want you to notice some things about these perilous times that Paul wrote about. I'm not trying to scare you today. I'm trying to challenge you and I'm trying to encourage you. God is on the throne. God has not been caught off guard by one event that has taken place around the world or even in your backyard. Notice what Paul said here in 2 Timothy about perilous times. There is the declaration of perilous times. Notice what he said here in the first verse. He said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. He declared the season for these perilous times. 
For when are these perilous times? When are these dangerous times? When are these days that it will be difficult to live, difficult to bear with? When are these times? He said there in the first verse, this season of this is the last days. What are the last days? That word last days is where we get the term eschatology. It's the word eschatos. We get the term eschatology. It has the idea of the study of last days or the study of final things. The la term last days or latter days is similar. Uh, they are similar and they are used both in the Old and in the New Testament. Uh, the last days are used for the church age as well as the last days for the nation of Israel. What time the term refers to in our Word of God is therefore going to be determined by the context. And right here in our text, it is the traditional belief by most Bible-believing fundamentalists like myself that the expression in the last days refers to the time specifically that is immediately preceding the rapture of the church and the second event of the Lord Jesus Christ. This corresponds to the use of the term the way Peter used it in 2 Peter in verse 3 and 4, where he said, There shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? Last days, last days, perilous times, dangerous times. The word times has the idea of in due season, or in a seasonable time. That word is translated seasons many other times in the Bible. In the last days, perilous times. There's going to be seasons of peril, seasons of trouble, seasons that are difficult. Perilous times shall come in the last days. In the last days. This word seasons the peril, describes the perilous conditions. They have come and they will come in varying intensity periodically throughout the world until the time the Lord returns. Uh, these are the sad characteristics and they are at last not the exclusive property of that last period for in different ways and degree, degrees they have appeared and they will appear throughout the years. Every age, every period of time has had these times, these seasons to the extent that in, within every age believers have felt that the conditions of the time indicated the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul did not limit perilous times to the last days, but he simply said that in the last days, those days would be characterized by having perilous times. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that the Bible said that in the last days, perilous times shall come. That is the season. That is the season for perilous times. We see the declaration of that date. The declaration of the season. But we also see the declaration of the surety. The surety that perilous times shall come. Paul said this know. This know also that in the last times perilous times shall come. That idea of this know, this know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Uh, when we look into the Word of God, we understand that God has declared these times, but some are not sure about them. But God wants us to know that perilous times shall come. That word know has the idea to come to an understanding, to be aware of, and to be sure of. This is em emphasizing that the opposition is not just a passing situation, but rather it will be a permanent characteristic that will be most marked now in the last days. Just as Timothy was to learn and to understand that perilous times shall come, we should be sure of this as well. They shall come. They shall be at hand. They shall be present. They shall instantly come upon us. Ladies and gentlemen, things are not going to get better and better, but they're going to get worse and worse until the time that our Lord Jesus Christ returns. These conditions are very pronounced in our day. And since the times are especially dangerous and difficult for believers, we look in our text as a good warning to believers to prepare you and I 
for these perilous times, these perilous days. If you're wondering when are the last days, I'll just help you. We've been in the last days since the coming of Christ, and we'll be in the last days until He returns. So there's the declaration, the declaration of perilous times. They're coming. And then we also have the description of perilous times. In verse 2 through 5, Paul gives us a description of the characteristics of this age. He lists 19 characteristics that will mark the activity, will mark the attitudes, will mark the actions of this day in which we live. The description. This is going to be a time, and it is a time, of mass corruption that involves the breakdown of law and tradition. We see here throughout these verses the morality and the mentality of perilous times. I'll give them to you and describe them briefly, all 19 of them. The first one he said, Men shall be lovers of their own selves. The idea here is that they love oneself. They are selfish, fond of self. This is the self-esteem emphasis of our day. And it fits very well into our culture in which we live. And then he said covetous. Covetous, that is, they love money. They are fond of silver. Our day sees this prominently exhibited from business to the entertainment field, to the sports world, even into our churches. Then he said boasters. This word boaster speaks of an empty pretender, a braggart. There's much boasting done today. Politicians, preachers, businessmen, educators, athletes, they all boast of their own greatness. I remember years ago, some of y'all will remember a man named Cassius Clay. Some of you know him as Muhammad Ali. Y'all know, fly like a butterfly, sting like a bee, nobody better than Muhammad Ali. Cassius Clay said, I am the greatest. That mentality has swept across our land. People think they're great. They think they are all that and a bag of chips. Can I get a witness? A lot of preachers, a lot of preachers even in our day, think they have arrived, think they have all the answers. I could preach right there all day, and y'all would shout. But what about the people in our churches boasting, bragging about what they do, what they've done, what they can do, who they are, where they've been? And then he said proud, proud. To be proud is to show oneself above others, to be preeminent or haughty. It's the attitude of a person who thinks they are better than someone else. Blasphemers. The word blasphemers means speaking evil and slanders, reproachful words, railing and abusive language. It's not just profane speaking that dishonors God, but this includes any type of crude and abusive language toward anyone and everyone. Then he says this, disobedient to parents. That is, they are unpersuadable. They are not compliant. Ladies and gentlemen, juvenile delinquency is almost the norm. It's almost a government-mandated program in our day with the lack of discipline in children in the home in our day. Unthankful. That is, to be ungracious, to be unpleasing. They have a lack of thanksgiving towards God and man, especially Prominent in our day is this attitude. You see it day in and day out. You watch someone sit down to eat. Rarely do you see anyone bow their head and say thanks. God help us. Even a good dog will lick his master's hand. Unthankful. Unholy. The idea of unholy is to be impious or wicked. Speaking of wickedness that is rampant. It's not just limited to impiety, although it can be, uh, but it's, it's, it's a picture of all sin. Because all sin is against God. 
Remember David when he committed adultery? When he prayed in Psalm 51, 4, he said, Against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Without natural affection. That is, they are hard-hearted towards kindred. They are unsociable, inhumane. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you, abortion and abuse on the rise in our day is a lack of a normal, natural affection. Are you listening? It's not normal, it's not natural for a mom to carry a child, a precious being in her womb, and to go into a doctor's office and say, here, kill it, dispose of it, I don't want it. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but that's not normal, that's not natural. God will not bless it. Truce breakers. Without treaty or covenant, they cannot be persuaded. They are irreconcilable. How rampant is that in our day where people can't make a deal? They can't come to grips. They've got to have their own way. They take their ball and go home. It causes many divisions. It causes friendships to split. It causes divorces. It causes splits because they are truce breakers, false accusers. The word false accusers here is an interesting word. It's the word diabolos. Same word we get Satan, the false accuser, the slanderer. It's prone to slander applied to those that cause, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they are opposing the cause of God. And thus they are playing the part and acting as if they are the devil. It's a picture of that. It's, it's the word used to describe the perjury in a court of law. Slander outside the court. This speaks of all the lying that goes on during these perilous times. Used to be you could make a deal with someone. You could shake their hand. Now you've got to sign 85,000 pieces of paper and get 18 lawyers to sign off on them to try to keep somebody, to keep the word. Incontinent. Incontinent, that is without self-control. Powerless over their flesh. It's a lack of self-control. You see adultery and sodomy and gluttony and drunkenness, all preeminent in the day and age in which we live, illustrating and showing to us the lack of control that people have over their physical appetites. Fierce. That is not tame. Savage. When you think of fierce, you think of someone like Adolf Hitler. Killing. Murdering seeking to put people out of existence. You think of the torture. You think of someone like Saddam Hussein. You think of someone like Osama bin Laden. You think of these terrorists. You think of these leaders that are fierce. They are savage. But the Bible describes that in the last days, that in these perilous times, that within the realms of professing Christendom, the church, you'll find people who are described as fierce. They're savage. They cut your throat for their own good. And then he says, despisers of those that are good. That is, they are opposed to goodness and to good men. They are hostile to virtue. The liberal media, the news in our day is a great illustration of despisers of those that are good. They oppose anyone and anything that is wholesome. Our United States government legislates to protect wicked abortionists, but they arrest good people who try to protest it. Something's wrong, friend. Is anybody here this morning? We try to protect the spotted owl, but we kill precious babies. And write tickets to anybody who dares lift up their voice and say, 
Don't do it. There's another way. There's an alternative. They write citations to pastors and people who try to assemble in the realms of a local New Testament church while they turn criminals loose to go back out on the street. They are despisers of those that are good. Traitors. The word traitors is the idea of betrayer. It's one who gives someone over to another or to the enemy. They're untrustworthy. It's too many, way too many people like that in our day. They'll rat you out for anything. They're a traitor. They pretend to be your friend. We think of Judas who betrayed the Lord Jesus. And in our day, there are people that will call themselves your friend and they'll betray. And we see this characteristic throughout our day. High-minded, heady, heady, high-minded. Heady is to fall forwards, is to fall headlong. It speaks of those who act rashly and recklessly. This is the headstrong person who will not listen to wise counsel. They often have conduct that is controlled by their emotions, not by principle or truth. And then high-minded. The idea of high-minded is like, it's a picture of someone raising smoke. There is a mist rising to be high-minded. It's, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's a description in our day. Heady, high-minded. I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when we look at these descriptions, we see these things coming to pass. We see what's going on all around us. We see all of these things. This high-minded is, is really a, a mist, a smoke that's being raised. It's a picture of someone who's being puffed up with pride. This is a, it's almost like a repeat of the proud that he mentioned earlier. It could be to emphasize the fact that pride is so prevalent in our day. Then he says, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasures. That is, they are fond of pleasure to a degree, a greater degree, rather than loving God. We see in our day the popularity of sports on Sunday, the Lord's Day, while church attendance declines. This confirms the problem is certainly with us today. Not to mention all the other attractions and entertainments that draw people away from God, draw people away from His Word, draw people away from the house of God, draw people away from serving God, robbing God of His adoration and His worship, of which He alone is worthy. People in our day within the realm of the professing church, are seeking happiness, not holiness. They're seeking games, not God. They're seeking fun, not faith. This is a description of perilous times. Paul said, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that this would be a description of the day just before Jesus returns. Are y'all listening? Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. God help us. There's a lot of people that didn't need the government to tell the church they couldn't go. They wasn't going to go anyway. The government just gave them another excuse. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, listen, but denying the power thereof. Having a form speaks of a shape, a fashion, a semblance, an appearance of reverence, a form of piety to God or godliness. But they are denying, they are rejecting, they are refusing the very power and the very ability of God in their life. 
This speaks of a form without force, a shape without strength, a semblance without substance. They are like window displays where everything in the window looks really pretty, but when you go in the door, the store is empty. Churches emphasize banners, slogans, robes. They have the form, but too often they lack true spirituality and life. You fold your hands in the prayer meeting, and you may look holy, but it's your heart, not your hands that are deficient in this evil day. People come to services, they sing the hymns, they sing the songs, they carry a Bible, they even pray, but they're not real. They have a form without a foundation. They have an outward show without an inward reality. One man said they're as empty as an upside down bucket and as dry as burnt sawdust. I have to remind you this morning that everything that glitters is not gold. Everybody that stands in a pulpit is not a preacher. And everybody that walks in a church is not a Christian. You're not a Christian because you're in church no more than you're an automobile because you sit in a garage. No wonder Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobate. There are many today who do not possess what they profess. They have a physical appearance, but they have no spiritual abiding within them. There's the declaration of perilous times. There's a description of perilous times. Thirdly, there is the dilemma in perilous times. In verses 6 through 13, we see this dilemma laid out. We see an illustration of pretenders. He said of this sort. That is, out of these, the same ones he just described, out of the counterfeits, counterfeits that he's just described to you and I, he said, here they are. They come in creeping. They creep into houses. The word creep means to put on or to clothe of a garment is to insinuate oneself into, to enter in, to sink into, and to sneak into. It's a picture of how they deceitfully pursue their goal. Like a subtle snake disguised as a servant. They sneak in to these houses. And they find women. Women who have a husband but he's not home. They sneak in when he's away, when these women are vulnerable. And they, the Bible said they lead captive. Silly women. Laden with sin, led away with divers' lust, led away. They lead them captive. The idea is they take them capture, they imprison them. These are men who are womanizers. They are wooing and they are drawing the worldly minded and the weak women. Silly women, the Bible describes. It doesn't say that all women are silly, but it describes these specific women as silly. It's, it's that they are foolish. It's not that they're uneducated, but it's that they're unstable. They have a lack of stability. They, are, they have a changeable mind. They are prone to new ideas. They are easily swayed. They're gullible. They are vacillating. And he said they are laden with sins. That is, they have a load of sins piled up on them. These are carnal, corrupt women. They're swayed by their impulses of their flesh. They carry a load of sin coupled with that guilt. And thus they are vulnerable and they are gullible to these false teachers. He said they are led away with divers lust. That is, they are taken with Various desires and cravings that are forbidden. These imposters gain ground on them. 
because they are preying on their senses. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just what the Bible says. There is the illustration of these men. And then in the, in the next verse, he speaks of, <coughs> excuse me, however learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are ever learning. They, they, are, they are open to ideas. They are open to things. They are listening. They always want to hear some new idea. They always want to hear some new doctrine. But they're never able to come to the saving knowledge of truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he uses a description here. He speaks not only of their creeping, but he speaks of their corruption and in, in, in how they copy. He says in verse number 8, As Janus and Jamus withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So here's what we find about them. We find that these men, they are copying, they are, a, or they are like, he said, as Janus and Jambres. Janus and Jambres were is the, evidently the names of the magicians in Moses' day back in Egypt. In Exodus chapter number 7. And he said, as Janus and jo Jambres were, they withstood Moses, so do these resist truth. The idea of resisting is that they oppose, they withstand. They're in opposition to truth. So these men are defiant of truth. They are defiant to the man of God. They are defiant to the message of God. Not only are they defiant, but they are depraved. He said they, have, they are men of corrupt minds. Corrupt minds, speaking of their deep depravity of mind, their wickedness. Then he said this, they're disapproved. They may look like a minister, they may try to act like a minister, but they are like snakes slithering in. They are like a wolf in sheep's clothing. He said in the latter part of verse 8, they are reprobate concerning the faith. That word reprobate means they are worthless. They are unapproved. They do not meet the test. Copy. Creepy. Verse number 9, we see their condemnation. He said they shall proceed no further. Their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. They shall proceed no further. There's an end. There is an end to them. God will only allow them to go so far. Their folly shall be made manifest. They're going to be exposed. God's going to reveal who they really are. And they're going to be an example, he said, unto all men, even as theirs also was. Just as God revealed that Janus and Jambres was not real, they were not really working miracles, God is going to reveal that these false teachers in the last times are not real. There's going to be a time when God says, that's too far, you're not going any further. Why does He let them go as far as He does? I don't know, other than to give people a choice. And so we see that He's still in control. But we see... They're creeping in. We see their corruption. We see their condemnation. And then we see, <coughs> excuse me, we have seen the declaration. We have seen the description. We have seen the dilemma. But now we are looking at not only the illustration of these pretenders, but I see here in verse number 10 and 11 the inspiration. The inspiration of the Apostle Paul, a great example. He said, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, persecutions, afflictions. He talks in verse number 10, you knew Paul's testimony. They knew how he had consistently had Christian character. They had seen him day in and day out. And then in verse 11, he says there had been a... Not only a testimony that he showed them, but they knew his trying. They knew his, 
his troubles, persecutions, afflictions. He talked about persecutions. But he said there had been a divine deliverer. In the midst of all of these persecutions and afflictions, he said, but the Lord delivered me out of them all. He said, I endured them. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Can I remind you, church, in the midst of perilous times, in the midst of troubled days, in the midst of these dangerous seasons, you think it's too hard to bear. Can I just help you? The Lord is on your side. The Lord will deliver you. The Lord will bring you through. Then he gives them the truth. He said, you know the truth. In verse 12, Yea, and all they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Shall suffer persecution. I believe it was Brother Oliver B. Green. Dr. Green said the only people that escape persecution are those that are playing ball with the devil. If you're going to live as Christ in this wicked present world, you're going to face some persecution. It may not be as extreme as others, but you will face opposition. You will face persecution. And then in verses 14 and following, I'll hurriedly say, we see the duty. We see the duty of you and I in perilous times. What is our duty, preacher? How should I respond in these perilous times? How should I live in perilous times? Well, in verse number 1, he said, you can be sure. This no. You see that? This no. He didn't say this think. He didn't say this guess. But in verse 1, he said, you ought to be sure. When you see these things take place, when you see society, and you see the perilous times, and you see how bad it is around you, that doesn't give you a cause to doubt God and to wonder if God's still in control. When you see things taking place that God has said would come to pass, that ought to cause you to be reminded and to be reassured that everything's working out just like God said it was going to happen. We are seeing persecution. We are seeing perilous times. We are seeing evil days. We are seeing dangerous times around us. And honey, it's right before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe He's coming just like He said. And I'll tell you, I believe He's coming sooner than you think. I'm telling you, one of these days, and it may not be very long, Jesus Christ is going to step out on the clouds, and the trumpet's going to blow, and Jesus is going to say, come up hither, and honey, we're out of here. And I'm telling you, there are some things that you need to know. You need to know that when you see these things coming to pass, it's not time to drop your head, but it's time to lift your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. But not only are we to be sure, we're to be separated. Oh, Sunday morning, Park Lot Church, separated. He gives us that description in verse number 2 through 5 of how all those evil descriptions of what I read a while ago. And then at the end of verse number 5, there's this little phrase, from such, turn away. From such, turn away. That is, from such, you go the other way. Turn yourself aside. Be separated from all this wickedness. Don't be a part of this wickedness. You say, well, preacher, I'm not going to do what they do. I'm just going to hang out with them and be their friend. Listen real good right up in here. Look up in here for a second. You cannot commune with corruption and not become contaminated with it. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You start spending the bulk of your time with the people that he describes. You start hanging out with the people that we read the descriptions of earlier. 
You be with them more than you're with the people who love the Lord, love the Word of God. Listen, if you, you've got to go to work, but on your leisure time, when you're out there, hey, honey, hook, hunkered up into the pleasures of the world, just like the rest of the world, you're going to become like them. We are to be sure of some things. We are to be separated. Then we are to be steadfast. He said there in verse number 14, But continue thou. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. It's been assured of. I'll just hurriedly say this. The one that he had been assured of by Timothy had been taught and assured by the Apostle Paul. Hey, Timothy, in these perilous times, stick with the man of God. Stick with God's servant. He's there to lead you. He's there to guide you. He's there to look out for your soul. He's there to feed you. He's there to help you. Stick with the man of God. And then he said this, And from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Stick with the message. Not just the man of God, but stick with the message of God. The message of salvation. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How did you learn you was a sinner? It's the word of God that said all of sin and come short of the glory of God. How did you learn that sin had a price to pay? It's the word of God that said the wages of sin is death. How did you know there was salvation in Jesus Christ? It's the word of God that said but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the word of God. It's the message of God's word. Stick with the man of God. Stick with the message. Salvation by grace through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Stick with the message. Stick with the manuscripts. Verse 16, all Scripture. All Scripture. Not just part of, not just the New Testament. All Scripture, from cover to cover. You say, well, that's just the originals, preacher. I want to take you to college just for a second. When Paul wrote this to Timothy, Timothy did not have the original Pentateuch. Timothy did not have the original book of Jeremiah. Timothy did not have the original Old Testament scrolls. Are you listening to me? He had copies of copies of copies of copies. We're not just talking about the originals. We don't have the originals. Somebody help me. We have a King James Bible that God has preserved for you and I this morning. That's the Word of God. It's totally inspired. It's totally inerrant. It's totally infallible. It's totally preserved. It is not containing the Word of God. It is the Word of God. I don't need another Bible. You don't need another version. You just need to read the one you got. Stick with the man of God. Stick with the message of God's Word. And stick with God's Word. Don't go looking for some kind of new age fango, jango. You say, well, they only changed this and they cha only changed that. Let me ask you a question. When you go get you a Coca-Cola, because that's what all God's people drink, right? Somebody help me. You go get you a Coca-Cola or a Dr. Pepper. How much, how much poison you want me to put in there? Just a little bit or a lot? You don't want none, do you? Is that right? You don't want no poison in your Coca-Cola. You want it pure. Is that right? You want it pure. You want it straight. When I get in that Word of God right there, I know it's Sunday morning. Trying to help you. 
I don't want a little bit of corruption. I don't want a little bit of perversion. I don't want this word left out and this work changed. I want it straight. Hey, I'm telling you, I like the real thing. I don't like, I, I don't, listen, when I was a kid, how many of y'all remember New Coke? Somebody remember New Coke? It was a good thing to forget, but I think all y'all probably remember it. It didn't last. You know why? Because it wasn't the real thing. You come over to my house and ask for a glass of milk, you ain't getting no blue top. Help me, Brother Bill. You ain't getting no purple top. Is anybody here this morning? Hey, we might as well lay it out where we're at. When you come over to my house and get a cup of milk, you getting a red top, amen. You getting a real thing, vitamin D, homogenized. I'm talking about the real deal, whole milk. And when you come to my church and you want to hear preaching, you ain't getting no NIV, you ain't getting no ESV, you ain't getting no New King James, you ain't getting no NASP. You're going to get the KJV, amen. And they can make fun, they can laugh at us, they'll, they'll find this video, they'll make fun of us on the internet. I don't care what they say, but I just thank God. I got a word of God, amen, and I'm a press on. So let me encourage you, walk on, press on, go on in Jesus' name. We've got the word of God. We've got salvation by grace through faith. We have a reason to rejoice. Let's press on. In Jesus' name. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for your help today. God, despite the difficulties, despite the distractions, we thank you, God, for being real. I pray, God, that, Lord, you'd help us today. I pray, Lord, you speak to hearts. There may be someone here today that's not saved. There may be someone listening by way of Internet. They don't know Jesus as their personal Savior. I pray, God, you speak to their hearts and their lives. And I pray, God, that you'd help them to be saved before it be everlasting too late. I pray, God, that you'd encourage Christians, encourage your people to press on, to continue, to be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. I pray, God, you'd help us today. We need you. I need you. These people need you. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. Bless us now. We're about to dismiss. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I want to say thank you if we're still online. I want to say thank you to those that have tuned in to the New Hope Baptist Church live stream. We count it an honor to be able to come into your home each week. Thank you for listening. May you come back and tune in with us at the next time. We're going to dismiss. We go dismiss in a word of prayer. If I can get one of you men that's inside to come out here with a offering plate, brother Danny, one of y'all inside, y'all wait. Can you stand out here? Do you mind, brother Chuck? Will stand there. And when you ride by, if you've got an offering, you can stick your offering in there. Thank you for being here. We'll be back next Sunday, same time. Y'all pray it's about ten degrees cooler. I'm gonna ask brother Benny to dismiss us in prayer. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for just allowing us to be here today, Lord. Just thank you for loving us, being good to us. Thank you for protecting all our church family, Lord, from this virus that's going around, Lord. That's Father, that you uh, bless Pastor, just begin to use him in a special way, Lord. That's Father, that you uh, just bless church, keep your hand upon it. As you go with us now, Lord, just lead and guide direct and just keep us all safe. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.